Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, there are some past passages in the Bible that are a little bit uh, vague. Uh, There are some passages in the Bible that are a little bit unclear as to the full meaning of them, but then there are other passages like this one that I think, I don't think there's a lot to miss in this one. I think that's about as clear as it can get, unless you think that, unless you think that, there is, that it is unclear, he says it again in verse 5 of Luke 13, the same thing. And I think the point he's making is there's really no middle ground. There's no halfway point. There's no, you know, the, the prodigal son isn't between the pig pen and home and say, well, I've made it far enough. Of course, that makes repentance necessary, doesn't it? Anybody that says that you're saved by anything alone and is probably not considering the passages of the Bible and maybe worse yet, ignoring it. Because clearly repentance is necessary to be saved. I mean, that's what the passage is saying. I actually read one uh, author recently who said that he believed that repentance is the hardest, uh, most difficult command in the Bible. That might be true. Uh, I read kind of the reasoning behind his statement, and it was, it was actually because of one reason is because it requires three things, not one. It requires the will, it requires the thought, and it requires the action. You can't have a little bit of one or the other. You can't have one without the other. It takes all of that, which makes it rather challenging, doesn't it? But then added to that, the fact that in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, the apostle Paul tells us that all have sinned, and then you start to get the, you know, the, the, the tremendous uh, aspect of how many of us need to repent. So you've got the difficulty of what it takes to repent, then you've got the enormity of who it is that needs to repent. And then you go to Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 5 where Paul tells us that a portion of uh, the, the way that we, are, that we are in contact with the blood of Jesus to have our sins washed away is to be buried in baptism, buried in that watery grave, to become a new creature. It's the blood of Jesus that is contacted. But that brings up the question, and again, this adds to the difficulty of repentance, and that is, is there something that is too far for for the blood of Jesus to forgive? Is there a sin that's so bad that that it cannot be forgiven of? And the answer is yes and no. There's no sin that's that bad, but any sin that we won't repent of, he can't forgive. Suppose a thief decided he wanted forgiveness Well, he says, this is my best way to make a living, so I'm not going to stop stealing. Can he be forgiven? Well, not according to Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. So I, I think that you've figured out by now that my topic this morning is the topic of repentance. Uh, and I'm going to approach this in a very simple way. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about what it's not, what it is, and then I'm going to try to motivate us to to follow along with what God says. So we're starting with this idea of misconceptions of repentance. Some people believe repentance is fear. I don't know that I've actually ever heard anybody say it, but I know a lot of people who have experienced that belief that repentance is just fear, but it's not. I mean, how many times have you seen people or maybe have you even in your own life got to this place to where you have faced something serious? Maybe it was as significant as a Uh, potentially fatal illness or injury or something like that, or maybe it was even lesser. It was just something you were going through, but you were afraid of where this was was going to end up. But whatever it was that you're going through, it's caused enough fear that you turn to God in your mind and you say, God, if you'll get me through this, I'm going to straighten my life out. I've heard a lot of people make promises like that. I've prayed for a lot of people that as they made promises like that. But my experience has taught me, not only in other people's lives, but in my own life, that if fear is 
is the motivating factor that when the fear goes away, the motivation goes away too. And then sometimes things don't change. True repentance is, is not the promise of change motivated by fear. True repentance is actual change. It's actually something different. Now, can there be fear, godly fear involved? Well, absolutely. In fact, I think that's a portion of why things do cause fear in our lives. I think that's a portion of why the way everything changed after Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden was to motivate us to recognize, I don't want to be out here anymore. I need to be motivated to go back. And I certainly I think that fear is a part of that. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 27 through 29, the wise man says, When terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So it's got to be, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more than fear. Fear is not repentance. Some people have the idea that repentance is regret. It's feeling sorry about something or being sorry about something. But that's not it either. I mean, there's no doubt. You can't read through the account of what happened to Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry and see the involvement of Judas and what happens with Judas. There can be no doubt that after it was over that Judas was sorry that it turned out the way that it did probably even sorry of his involvement with it, but he did not change anything. He went out in his sorrow and took his own life. See, that's because when I'm sorry about something doesn't mean that I've actually ever changed anything. When I'm sorry about something, is it actually usually just comes about either because of what I'm suffering makes me feel bad, or else I regret that I got caught. Nobody here has been there except me, right? That's not repentance. I heard a story about a man that uh, these two boys were throwing rocks. Uh, actually, uh, I, I heard this story, but I also lived this story when I was young. Me and a friend were throwing rocks uh, when I was in about first grade, I think it was. And uh, the cars that were going down the road, we were throwing rocks and we hit one, and he stopped, and we hid. And when my dad called us because he talked to my dad, we were sorry. But that wasn't the first rock we had thrown. So what we were sorry about is we got caught, and we were certainly sorrow about, sorrowful about the punishment we were going to face. But that's not repentance. That's not the same thing. That's what happened with Cain when he killed his brother. We don't ever see in the text anything, anywhere, where Cain shows any emotion whatsoever about his brother or what happened. But when God exerts punishment, all of a sudden he's sorrowful. He says it's just too much. It's just too hard. That's not repentance. That's sorrow. Some believe repentance is a prayer. It's not. It's not. Prayer may be a part of the expression that you have repented. It may be a part of approaching God and, and seeking His forgiveness in your repentance, but it's not repentance. It's not because prayer hasn't changed any behavior. Nothing's changed in a, in a prayer. You, you can't go to a mourner's bench and tear out your, your repentance. It's about actions. Some believe repentance is being convicted that something is wrong, but, well, that's not true any, either. I think that probably every single one of us at some point or another in our lives has known something was wrong and yet did it anyway. So knowing that it was wrong, well, that's, that's not repentance. In fact, I've heard people say, I don't think I've ever said this, but maybe I have. I've heard people say, I knew it was wrong, but I just couldn't help myself. Well, we can help ourselves. It's just an excuse. Remember Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 when he says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You know what he said? You don't have to sin. Sometimes we choose to. But just the knowledge 
the knowledge that something's wrong, it's, it's, it's not repentance. So if all of those things are not repentance, and they actually are areas that people seem to think that is repentance, but if they're not, then, then what is? What is repentance? Well, first of all, you've got to understand that repentance is actually something you do, not something that you receive. Forgiveness is what you receive. Repentance is what you, what you do. Man does the repenting, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And by the way, as we have seen in Luke 13 and verse 3 and 5, this is actually a command, right? I mean, you get that? Jesus says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. That's a command, right? And you recognize that God has never issued us a command that we cannot do and that commands are things that he expects us to obey, which means there's some kind of action here, right? Repentance. We've got to understand it involves a mental act, a resolution of the mind that motivates you to change what you're doing and take a different course of direction in your life. It's a little more complicated than what we were talking about that repentance is not, right? It means that, it means that I change the way that I think and I change the way that I act. I change the things that I'm doing. It is actually taking my mind and overpowering my body and what I want to do to do what I'd rather do, which is be right with God. I change what I want to do, and then I change what I do. There's a passage. Open your Bibles to Matthew 21. Just a very short passage where uh, I, I think repentance is described. Matthew 21. This is Jesus trying to teach them. In parable, in Matthew 21, I'm going to start in verse 28 and read through 31. Listen to what he says. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go, work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented or regretted it and went. And then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, the tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. And did you listen to what he said? There was, there's two sons. They were both told to do the same thing. They both said the opposite. They said the opposite, each one of them. One of them said, I'll go, and one of them said, I won't go. Now, if you look at it, if you stop there and you say, which child was being obedient and which one was being disobedient, you would say the one that said, I, I, I'm not going out there. That's a disobedient child, except guess what? He did go. And the first child, though he said he would, did not go. So which one was obedient? It was the one who went. But in order to go, he had to repent. He had to change his mind. His mind said, I'm not going out there. He had to change that. And then he had to go. There were actions. He repented. Jesus was looking at those Jews that were standing around him and saying, you guys aren't going to enter into the kingdom because you're not willing to repent. But these people out here that you think are the great big sinners, guess what? They will. They'll change. And God will forgive them. That's genuine repentance. So when you take those elements all together and combine them, you recognize that repentance is something that you do when you turn from one direction and go the other direction as it relates to your relationship to God. You remember in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talks about the city of Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh was uh, the capital of the Assyrians, one of the most wicked groups of people ever on the face of the earth, the uh, Assyrians were. And Nineveh is its capital, and yet God goes to Jonah, and he says, Jonah, I want you to go preach. Jonah says, those people are so wicked, they don't deserve to be made right. He runs from God. We get stuck on the account of him getting swallowed up by the fish, but Jesus points to it and said, when he went back and preached, guess what? Those people repented. The people of Nineveh repented, he said. Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. They repented. But what did it mean? What did it mean? Is it just a word? Does it mean they believed Jonah? Does it mean they felt sorry? Did it, does it mean they prayed? Matt, Jonah 3, 8, we're told this. Jonah preached, but let every man and beast be covered in sackcloth 
and cry mightily to God, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. That was what repentance was. You guys, you guys can't keep acting like this. You can't keep living like this. You've, God's going to destroy you. 40 days, he's going to destroy you. You keep living like this. And Jesus said they did repent. They did repent. They turned from their evil ways. So because of the fact that the Assyrians and Nineveh and all of that is such an extreme example, you know, I, I think that there are times that we look at people today and we think it's like that, you know, where they're so far out there, they can't repent, or I'm so far gone, I can't repent and come back. It's just too hard. So I, I want to I go to point number three now, and I want to figure out why. What, what, what should cause us to be motivated to repent? Well, I think, I think very clearly one of the first things that should motivate us to repentance is the goodness of God. And I remember Paul saying in Romans chapter 2, in this chapter where he has just pointed out the, uh, the sins of the Gentile world, and so now in this chapter in Romans 2, he is turning to the Jews and saying, you've lived just like them. And in verse 4, he says, do you despise the riches and goodness and his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? If you could, if you could just take a moment and back up and consider Consider just how good God's been to you. I mean, we're here. We have life. We have so many blessings. We have so many things that come from God's hand, none of which we deserve. And knowing that he has been so good to me when I am his enemy and have been his enemy, then what about if I walk with him? I think his goodness is clearly a motivator. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And remember what he's talking about? He's saying that God sent his son not because we were just so wonderful, but to bless us even though we were so far from him. That should motivate us, right? I think so. I think another tremendous motivation to repentance is to recognize that God is offering this hope through his promises, and there are so many examples of his promises. I mean, God promises forgiveness. Think about that. Are there things in your life that you look back on and you say, well, I wish I'd have never done that? Things that maybe you're embarrassed about even? So foolish to be like that. And yet, God promises the hope of washing that all away, just disappearing. Oh, it's still going to have existed in your mind, but... Not his. Isn't that incredible? Rest? I don't know about you, but I'm tired. A lot. This world tends to just drag you down, doesn't it? And yet every once in a while, I know it hadn't rained in a while, but it's going to one day. And when it does, you know, I'm probably going to see a rainbow. And when I see that rainbow, I'm going to be reminded that I serve a God who makes promises and fulfills promises. And one of these days, I'm not going to be tired anymore. Remember Matthew 11, 28 and 29, when Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I got to tell you, I get tired physically a lot, but I get tired in my soul in this world, don't you? He promises rest. I think that's motivation. And still yet, another motivating thing for us to repent is called godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, Paul talked about it. He said, godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Of course you're going to be sorry if you got caught, but that's different than someone who says, you know what? I've sinned against my Creator. When you can see the cross and not think Adam put him there, or the Jewish leaders put him there, or the Romans put him there, but rather that I put him there, 
then you can be motivated to repent. That's godly sorrow. It's not the worldly sorrow that's sorry of the consequences or sorry of the getting caught. It's, it's godly sorrow. One more motivation. And that is our love for him. I mean, it was John 14 and 15 when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, didn't he? And that's another one of those very simple passages. If you love me, keep my commandments. Isn't that... Don't we understand that when it relates to our spouses and our children? We love them, so we act a certain way. Why would it be any different about God? In fact, the truth of the matter is it ought to be deeper about God. We crucified him. When I refuse to obey him, I'm just leaving him there. But love motivates us to come home. I think that statement about repentance being maybe one of the most difficult commands, maybe that's right. Because you see, repentance is a part of what we generally refer to as the plan of salvation because you can't just go and live in this life for self and turn to him. You have to turn to him, right? So repentance is a part of that. But the truth of the matter is repentance is a part of the growth of every day of our life once we do become a Christian. Because I'm not perfect and I'm not going to be perfect, and I don't know everything, and I'm not going to know everything. But as I grow and as I learn and I realize my imperfections, I seek to turn around and go the other way. I think if we'd be more willing to do that, we'd be more willing to walk with him. Luke chapter 16, there's the account of the rich man and Lazarus. And they're both living their lives. They're different lives. But they both come to the end of their lives. And one of them had refused to repent and change. But he wanted to. He wanted to. He just wanted to too late. And I can assure you, had that man had the opportunity to go back and get rid of everything that he had been blessed with on this earth to change that destination, he would have done it. And in fact, he wanted to go back just to keep his brothers from coming there too. What about you? What about you? You're here this morning, you're not a Christian. Repentance is involved. Not repentance alone. But it's involved in obeying the gospel. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe his word. You have to be willing to repent. You have to be willing to confess him before man. But even then, you cannot. You can run from your sins. You can turn them around, but you cannot get rid of them. You can't can't balance the scales. You You can't be good enough. You can't save enough other people to even get rid of one sin. But Jesus and his blood will get rid of all of them. When you're immersed in water, contacting his blood in order to be saved. It's already today. Maybe you're somebody who's been living contrary to him, and maybe your sins have been public, and your repentance is to be the same. You turn from where you are, and you go the other direction. You can do that today as well. If it's private, you can do that. But God desires us to turn to him. Don't leave halfway down the road. Don't stop halfway down the road. Whatever your needs are, if you need to receive.